you don't have to be a fast brushover, but you, you, you have, with the medley, the, the great thing is, is you have to be good at everything. You can't have yeah. one weak stroke and um, you, you have to be very balanced because um, that, that's, that's the entire point of the race is who, who's the best at all four strokes. Welcome to Social Kick. I'm Dr. John Mullen, physical therapist. We have a partial crew here, the historian, Mr. Luke Paddington. Brian is out there putting a little lift on his camper van. You know, he's a uh, Mr. Adventurous. And we're excited to have our guest, Finlay Nash, with us today. How are you doing, Finlay? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me and looking forward to it. Excellent. Well, we had some user rapid fire submissions on our Instagram account. So make sure you follow us at Social Kick Swim. But A underscore Leno8120 wants to know who's your favorite music artist? Um, oh boy. I would say right now it's uh, probably Dayglow. Um, I went and saw him in concert uh, a, a little over a year ago. Um, I'm um, definitely more of the, uh, I like a lot of different artists and there's not a particular one that I'm a uh, super a big fan of, but uh, Dayglo. All right. Alex Levisk underscore five. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Wants to know as a medley swimmer, what is your favorite stroke? Um, right now, outside of medley, it's backstroke. Uh, inside mm -hmm. of the medley, it's definitely the butterfly. Okay. Now, if you could invite any celebrity to join you for a swim practice, who would it be and why? Um, I would probably invite either uh, Mark McMorris or Nyjah Houston. Um, I feel like um, swimming is quite serious and not saying that like slope style or skateboarding is less serious, but they definitely bring a, a fun aspect to it. And I feel like they would uh, view it in a different way and uh, teach us some, some things about having fun. All right, last one here. And we had a lot of people, Mr. Cole Pratt, DJ Dot Landry, Blake Tierney, uh, Milo Wall, all want to know about your beard. Is the beard real? Are you keeping it? Who are the Muska beards? So we have a lot of questions about it, but it looks like we may have lost it already. No. Um, so uh, pretty much after Pan Am Games, it was, uh, it was Movember. And uh, three of us, uh, Blake Tierney was actually one of them, uh, Raven Doman and myself. Um, we all decided to grow our beards out. Um, and I am quite fair skinned. I, I'm a little bit ginger and I was not a fan of it, but they were like, you know, Worlds is in, you know, we're leaving in end of, uh, end of January. We might as well just keep it till Worlds. And I was like, you know, at the time I was like, sure, like why not? And ended up, you know, having to keep my word and we kept it. I was not a fan of it. I was very happy to see it go. Um, but we, we grew it out for, for a few months and uh, just kind of have fun with it. Oh, sick, man. All right. So, Finley, man, I've, uh, the world started hearing about you from, at least, I think, on ISL. You, you, you can't promise ISL and you're tearing it up. You were the Titans, weren't you? Who, who you saw for? Yeah. So, I my the season one, I was with Leonard Roar. Um, and That's then right. I was with Titans uh, season two and three. And, so, so yeah. and then, you know, you started dropping time like mad from 158 a few years ago, solid 157s. Now you're storming home and winning the Pan Am Games and winning the World Championships in 200 IM. So first of all, well done. That's freaking you. epic. You. you know, you're arguably the top IMers in the world right now and world champion. Uh, those who are listening, Finley came home and, and beat some, some um, favorites out of lane seven and, you know, continued to meet Canada's strong history in 200 IM. From Alex Bowman to Curtis Maiden. Now we got Philly Knox up there. It's pretty sick. Um, that talk to me about that. Talk to me about how how have the last four or five months been for you um with, with these championships and, and and where where it's been? Yeah, the, the last four or five months have, have definitely been interesting. Um some people know this, some people don't. I, I recently moved to Vancouver um at the end of uh August. So new training program, new um new coach, new lifestyle. Um, so a, a little bit of a, a change, but still kind of un, under that uh, Swim Canada umbrella with the, the high performance centers. Um, yep. But yeah, it's, you know, I, I think the last four months, five months, um, putting away the, the the competitions aside, it's the same as every month, um, you know, progressing and trying to improve each week and improve each month and pushing uh, the limits in practice for, for ourselves and and just getting sharper and um, yeah, just trying to enjoy, enjoy myself and, and have fun and keep, keep this rolling. So. 
Uh, I love that. Okay, well, well let's, I want to get into the races eventually, sure. but let's get into where you are now then. Um, so yeah, you said you moved to Vancouver and you're training under Scott Talbot uh, 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 from a family of legendary coaching um, yeah, and, and, and experience. Talk to me about why you made that decision and how has it been since you made the move? Yeah, it, it's, the move has been fantastic. Uh, I work really well with Scott and um, yeah, I, I decided to make the move um, pretty much after trials of last year in April. Um, mm -hmm. I just wasn't really happy in, in Toronto. Uh, nothing to do with the coaching or, or what they had available there, but um, uh, it's just training with some older athletes and some younger athletes. It, it was, uh, I was kind of in the middle of, you know, I was 22 at the time and, um, you know, the, the next closest age was either 17, 16 or uh, 26, 27. So I, I was kind of in a, a weird, a weird stage. And um, yeah. uh, HPC Ontario is very uh, girl heavy as well. Uh, they've yep. had a lot of success with, with females and um, it, it's great training with girls. They push you more than, than ever, but um, you know, I, I just kind of needed to be in an environment where I was, I was surrounded by, uh, just more kids, my, or like people, my age and, um, kind of the lifestyle I'm living where it's, you know, trying to go to school and being surrounded yeah. by people you, you can kind of joke around and, um, you know, tease and practice a little bit. And, um, that, that's kind of what was available in Vancouver. Um, yeah. I did look around. I was, uh, I was in Australia for about a month last year with, oh, nice. uh, Bowley and, um, it was actually their, their swimmers who recommended that I check out Scott because a lot oh, nice. of them actually trained under Scott and they're like, he's a yeah. fantastic coach. Um, if he's in Canada, obviously getting all the perks of being part of a, a high performance center and the support there, mm -hmm. um, they're like, you should definitely check it out. So, um, went and checked him out in, in May of last year, really liked what I was seeing and enjoyed the environment and, um, kind of made the decision right before worlds and, and just stuck with it. So. Yeah, swimming is such a unique sport. I mean, when I swam, I think I had two or three coaches my whole swimming career, really, like main coaches. Now with ISL, you're able to kind of be exposed to more coaches. Sounds like you're taking it in your own hands to work with some different coaches. But it really is one of those. It's like such a big deal when someone moves where in a lot of other sports, God, you'll have different coaches you'll be switching teams all the time like you think about professional I don't know basketball players or something they could be on five six teams you know in their career um I guess what is your view on like how often to switch coaches or kind of have that whole process on how swimming is with coaching yeah obviously there is that stigma you have certain swimmers you know like Phelps is a classic one where he's with Bowman his his whole life but um whenever we're at we're at training camps or um you know, coaches come in and, and view practices. I, I, you know, the more eyes on, on swimming, the better. And, um, the more opinions you can get, you know, it you know, I try to take it, um, as positives and, and just try to learn from, from every coach I see. And, um, every, every different coach is going to have a different view on swimming and different view on a stroke. And, um, you know, the, I feel like the best way to improve is to expand your knowledge and, and learn from other coaches, uh, in terms of moving coaches, uh, for a training location, it's definitely a little bit better to to keep consistent. Um, when I was back just south of Calgary uh, in my age group days, I was, I was with Todd Melton. He was the, the head coach of the Okotoks Mavericks for uh, I was I was with him from like 11 years old to to 18 before I moved out to Toronto with with Ben Titley. And um, mm -hmm. so I, I did go through a period of of a stable coach for a quite a long time, but. Um, you know, once you get to a certain level in swimming, all the coaches, they have the same view and the same goal. And um, as long as you're uh, just committed to what their program is and just enjoying the process, I, I personally believe anyone can succeed at any type of program. Um, you know, you, you look, everyone's doing different. Um, some people are doing like the, the super short training. Some people are doing long aerobic stuff. By the end of the day, once it comes to a, a swim meet and everyone gets up on those blocks, it's it's very evenly matched uh, along most of the the, the races. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, as long as you have a good connection with the coach and, and you're enjoying yourself and and you trust what you're doing, uh, it's going to make you the best swimmer out there. Yeah, like you said, environment is huge and things change over time, right? Like you said, now, you know, training with maybe some more people your age. 
Um, what have any like uh, pranks or things that the guys have done with each other? Has anything uh, come to mind? Uh, I wouldn't say pranks, but you know, it's we're all you know we're, we're in our early twenties. You, you tease them for absolutely everything, and it, it's just that good banter that you need in practice, and um, it definitely makes it a little bit more joy. I'm, I'm quite serious as a swimmer, especially when it comes to training, so it helps me uh, just relax a little bit and and just enjoy the the process of being you know you're you're training. 27 hours a week if you're being serious and focused for 27 hours it, it's taxing on the, the mind and the body as well so um you know it's I, I i put a lot of credit to the guys that um i train with to keep you know just keep the banter going and, and um just helping me enjoy the the process so i think it's really really important i, I like it um but let's talk about the program then so you are 10 weeks out from trials um, what is your plan for trials, which are in Montreal, the best city in Canada? Yeah, um, I, knew. <laughs> <laughs> I had to plug it. Um, yeah, let's talk about the plan for trials because yeah. you have the, the cut, the under the Olympic cut, that one for six six, but you still have to place top two. And and are you going to be? Are, do you know if you're going to come down completely for it? Are you going to try and qualify on for relay teams? What's your plan for the next ten weeks leading into trials? Yeah, so obviously the Olympics don't happen if if trials doesn't go according to plan. So um, I think uh, obviously we'll have those discussions with with Scott and and our staff to to kind of fine point the the right idea. But the the approach is similar to every meet. It's uh, make sure you get a good training block in, cut down to what we kind of need to do so we can perform and get a spot on that team. Um, you know, Canada's. Maybe not as uh, as deep as the U.S. or Australia, but um, you know, I would say the the top three spots are definitely very strong in any stroke. So yep. um, you know, you definitely can't go in not shaved, not tapered, and expect to to perform well because obviously you, you have a lot of well rounded swimmers in Canada, and then every year there's going to be some kid that you don't know, you've never heard of, who comes out of nowhere and is ripping fast, fast times. Ilya, for example, obviously yeah. <laughs> for the U.S., but now coming to Canada, it's, you know, you, you can't go in to these trials expecting you're going to just make the team. Yeah. It's, it's still, you got to go in there, get the job done. Um, and we have a late trials this time, which is different to what we what we usually have. But um, leading, into, uh, leading into Tokyo back in 2021, we did have a late trials due to COVID. And um, yeah. we, we, shaved, we cut down, shaved tapered for that. Um, and then we we're able to kind of build back up a little bit and do a, a double taper per se. Um, and that worked out for a lot of athletes. So um, in terms of how much we're cutting down, how much that, that's, I guess, the discussion that we've yeah. got to have with the coach and, and kind of figure out where we're at physically uh, leading into the, uh, the competition. But, um, you know, the, the plan is to go there and swim fast and, and get on that team. From, from, from my perspective you have a chance to medal in three events in, in in paris you know the two relays and obviously the i am is there anything else you're you're going for besides 100 free 200 free two i am you're doing two back well what are you up to yeah i think um i definitely want to to be on that medley relay with those guys that's that's a really fun um so we'll see whether that's uh we give a shot at the, the 100 breaststroke or the 100 backstroke um, you know, I think Ilya and Josh, they kind of have the, the flying yeah. free covered. Um, but yeah, we'll see. It, it all depends on with, with being a medley swimmer. Obviously we're training all four strokes and yeah. with training all four strokes. Um, some, sometimes the strokes are in and they're, they're, they're flowing well and sometimes they're not. So it kind of all depends. I'll, I'll probably enter a few events for trials, um, and then scratch a few and then yeah, just yeah. giving it everything we have. Obviously those relays are uh, something that's that's really big. I definitely would like to have more than one individual, but then again, it, it all it all comes down to what happens at trials and and how we perform, and um, and then whatever happens, uh, go from there. What pool is it at trials? Is it at PPO? Is it the Olympic pool? Or yeah, it's it's the, it's the uh, the Olympic pool in Montreal. Okay, so so those who are listening, the coolest pool to swim at, and the most annoying pool to swim at if you're a backstroker. Hmm. Yes. Because if you ever swim in that pool, John, definitely describe it. It's curved lines. Oh, man. Yeah. So the roof, it's got uh, it's crazy design of the building. But for backstroke, it's definitely not straight. And um, 
I've definitely heard some rumors that they might be doing something to fix that, oh. uh, maybe putting a tarp over. But then again, it's we don't know if that's going to happen. We're kind of hearing some whispers from the Montreal crew. But um, as as a someone who's not confident in backstroke and is backstroke isn't my my go to, I yeah. really hope they do something because uh, that's not something I want to be be worrying about. Um, but then again, you know, there's other ways to kind of spot yourself to make sure you're swimming straight and uh, some are a little bit more annoying, but we'll, we'll, we'll go there and we'll assess the situation out and, and attack it from there. Another small bit. It's the one pool that has a floor that goes up and down. And we used to go there and practice oh. there and the floor would malfunction and it would be too shallow or too deep and stuff. It was really annoying, oh, yeah, but really it's really a beautiful good. pool. Go ahead. No. Yeah, it's, 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 it's beautiful. And I think obviously not as a swimmer, but they have the, uh, like the 20 meter diving, yeah. um, platform there and i think that's that's pretty cool seeing like i've never seen those those athletes jump off them but um there's a canadian diver uh, molly carson who's uh she posts a lot of of she trains out there and i think that's really really neat i agree all right what's worse the curved ceiling you're talking about or looking into the sun on backstroke i would say a curved ceiling because okay. At least if you're in the sun, you know that you're getting, you know, maybe a little bit of a tan. Myself, <laughs> but um, no, the, the, the curved ceiling definitely makes it a little bit more tricky because if you're used to spotting off of the roof um, yeah. and you believe it's straight, you're going to follow the roof and all of a sudden you're going to be over the lane rope. So that's a little bit more frustrating. Um, a lot of us backstrokers and I am swimmers had some issues at, at Worlds, but um, we were able to kind of attack it there. So no issue. All right, in twenty meters, you're jumping off. What's your what's your dive of choice? If you could, what's the fanciest thing you think you could realistically do off twenty meters? Oh, 20 twenty meter. That's so high. I've jumped off. Um, I've jumped off an eighteen meter cliff, and you know, at, at that height, you're just. I think you're just straight jumping it. Um, if you try to throw a gainer or, or like a floaty back foot, um, there's just two. You know there's too many things that could possibly go wrong at that height. If you kind of belly flop off of like a 10, 11 meters, you can kind of get away, but at that height, you're done. So I think just straight, straight jumping it and, and hoping I land on my feet. And just a little that. safety warning for those who are watching, make sure you, that you jump with your arms folded and cross your legs because mm -hmm. wedgie is an understatement. <laughs> Take it from Luke. We've done some low level cliff diving in Trinidad together. So uh, he's got the the Caribbean and I'm to know exactly what to do. For real. Yeah. I remember on my recruiting trip to Tennessee, we got up to the 10 meters and it's outside. And that was my first time off a 10 meter. I'm like looking to the right. There's like a tree looking to the left. There's a building and like all the recruits, we all do pencils. But one yeah. of them did a gainer and we're like, oh, my God, this guy's going to kill himself. He just like ran past us and did a gainer. We're like, holy shit. Yeah, honestly, doing a gainer like a like a slow floaty backflip, it it definitely makes it easier to um, to kind of spot where you're at. Um, but the nerves beforehand are definitely a little <laughs> little more intense. All right, let's get into training a little more serious training than this jumping off of <laughs> 20 meters. So, like you said, every coach kind of has a, a different nuance or n different thing that they can provide and, and benefit. What have been some of the nuances or things Scott's um, helped you with this past, um, you know, training block? Yeah, I think uh, understanding kind of backgrounds of, of where swimmers come from and, and certain things that, you know, make a, a swimmer tick. So um, I came from a background where I did USRPT for um, – <laughs> five, six years and did a lot of filming and a lot of uh, technical work. So I would say for me as, as an athlete, I definitely spend a little bit more time working on technique and working on filming because that, that's something that works for me and, and it makes my brain tick. And, um, you know, he, he's very flexible with, with other athletes. We have, you know, Raven Doman, he came from open water and now he's a tuner backstroker. So uh, complete crazy switch, but, you know, coming from a background where he's, you know, putting up 100K weeks, he definitely likes to have a little bit more mileage and, and more feel of the water. So um, for me, definitely like that that technique and, and filming and, and spending time working on making sure I'm swimming correctly and swimming efficiently. So when I am hurting and, and fatiguing in a race, I know that I'm not, 
you know, my stroke's not falling apart and, and I'm swimming incorrectly. So th those are a lot of the main things I like to do. Um, and then obviously just having uh, heart rate sets and um, back end speed and, and making sure you have that front end speed and just hitting all aspects of, of, of your energy systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, coming from USRPT, um, I, I want, we want to dive in that a little bit more because I really think it's it's interesting. I think a lot of people, you know, start with traditional training and then they started to do USRPT when it was becoming more more popularized. And I think that's a tough transition. But I do think starting with USRPT and then maybe transitioning into other nuances and, you know, maybe a little bit more higher volume, so to speak, doesn't have to be that big a difference is something that can be accomplished and like I said, an easier psychological transition. So I guess what has been your transition from moving away from USRPT? Yeah. So when I, when I moved to Toronto with Ben Titley, um, you know, obviously I was doing, um, you know, 4k workouts, 600 meter warm up, and then just three, 3.5 K of just race pace mm -hmm. to having some sessions that were 6k, 7k in length. And, um, it was tricky. It definitely like the first month it was, it took a while to adapt to. Um, but when, when you're younger between, for me, I, I did that training when I, between 13 and 18. And when you're young like that and your, your body recovers so quickly. And um, for me, obviously being a little biased because I did that, it, it made sense because, you know, you're, you're doing race pace every single day. You're getting up, you're swimming fast. I'm not old now, maybe when I'm on a team with summer, you feel old, but, um, <laughs> you know, the body def, you know, I've, I've put on quite a bit more muscle since then. I'm a bit yep. heavier in the water. The body needs yep. time to recover. So, yep. um, as a kid and as a junior, I felt like for me, it was perfect. It, I get bored very quickly. So having those uh, repetitions on, on quick and you, um, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're racing fast, it keeps it interesting. And as I've gotten older, I definitely enjoy those, uh, those like Friday morning sessions where it's a little smoother, just kind of swimming out. Um, so, I, you know, but at the same time, it, it all depends on, on what you believe. And, um, yeah. you know, again, the, the saying of like a happy swimmer is a fast swimmer. If you're doing something you believe in and you're happy doing it, then that's going to be the, the biggest benefit. Although he's not doing the two IM as often as he used to, you know, Michael Andrew is kind of the, the poster child for USRPT and everyone loves to talk about his, his last 50 and his two IM and God, he's was, you know, putting up some amazing times, but was still getting tons of, you know, flack for not being able to finish and oh, he needs to change his whole training program. And it's like, man, this guy's going to the Olympics. And in my opinion, I think it's working well. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think of those people and naysayers that say, oh, well, if he just did traditional training, he could finish better? Yeah, it's 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 a little frustrating because people just, I guess, from my perspective, they, they view the race and they see his last 15. They're like, obviously, he's not doing the work to, to finish. But, um, you know, he has come out and said he is a 50 hundred swimmer. He's got the speed and he's utilizing his strengths. Um, yeah. You know, for, for example, Obviously, we don't know what would happen, but if you were to get Caleb Dressel or or someone like that to to do a two in your freestyle and he would have foot turn, you know, a second or two seconds under world record pace with 50 to go. I'm you know, I'm just saying I don't think he's going to come back at 27. He's probably going to hurt quite a bit. So, um, you know, he's he's going into a two hundred nine. He's using his strengths and he's executing it the, the way he needs to. And, um, you know, there, there was a you know, he's going out 23 something in the fly and people are like, Oh, just slow down. And, you know, I, I come from the, the same understanding with him. It's like, I'm, I'm not the fastest swimmer out to the 50 and butterfly, but um, for me, if, if I go out at 24, six, like I was at worlds or I was out at 25, Oh, you know, 0.4 of a second, I'm out 0.4 slower, but it feels the exact same. Um, you know, it, it's just, you, you got to utilize your strengths and for him, it's to, to go. He, he knows how to sprint. He knows how to go fast. He's going to attack it. And he, he's swimming exactly how I think he should. Um, it, you know, if, if he were to go out a second slower and fly and be a little slower and backstroke, he, he's so used to being up in the water that when your body kind of sinks, it, it's hard. And for, especially for me, I totally understand that when it comes to, to backstroke, if, if my hips aren't up and I'm not rolling, I struggle a lot on that backstroke. So he, he's swimming exactly how he should. And I, I just think people love to take the opportunity to to hate, but you know you you tell them to go out 
you know, two seconds under world record pace at the the one fifty and um, you know, let them see see how bad that that last fifty <laughs> hurts. So I th- yeah, I, I respect everything he does and um, I think he's doing a fantastic job. Same here, we agree fully. But well, well, let's talk about the 200 IM race. Uh, you know, when you traditionally, when you watch a 200 IM, you're like, all right, just wait till the breaststroke, that's where it plays out. Wait till the breaststroke, that's where you play out. But is that really the case? I mean, when you think about the top IM as we've ever had, Locks and Phelps, their breaststroke was their weakest. And those mm-hmm. who are listening, it's they were ruined that week. So it went 33 lows. Um, um, and you know, they hammered down a 27 last 50, just like you just did. 27 7 is what you went. Um, do you have to be? A strong breaststroker to be a strong IMA? I wouldn't say you have to be a strong breaststroker to be a strong IMA, but you definitely can't be weak at breaststroke. Right. Um, you know, I, growing up as a junior, I was a breaststroker. Um, and looking at that field, I was definitely the weakest breaststroker. Mm. It, you know, my split yep. was terrible in that. And um, it definitely, you know, compares to if I'm going in and, and splitting a 34 five i believe i was on the fifth like yeah i'm not, I'm not making it through to the set of the, into the final that's just how it is um so you definitely have to be fast but that being said it's the same thing with being a fast back backstroker you know you got carson going 28 yeah. leon going 28 you know two years ago i was struggling to even break 30 in backstroke and for me it's if i'm not breaking 30 i'm you know i'm not even in that conversation so um you know it, you don't have to be a fast breaststroker but you you, you with the medley, the, the great thing is, is you have to be good at everything. You can't have yeah. one weak stroke and um, you, you have to be very balanced because um, that, that's that's the entire point of the race is who, who's the best at all four strokes. Uh, I, I remember um, my buddy George Ravel, bronze medalist in 200 IM in, in 04, and he was coming home and he says, Luke, I don't remember the last 50 that freestyle. It was so much pain, so much torture because I just hammered down that breaststroke so much. It was the most pain I felt in my life. And it was a very classic finish where Lochte just all touched him and he just all touched Shay. You had a very similar last 50, dude, at, at Worlds where you mm-hmm. came back on them and you, you, you hammered down and you got them on the touch at the end. You came from behind from third, Bar Shane and, and um, Carson. Talk us through that 200 IM. It was a classic lane seven victory that kick to us talk us through it yeah so um uh, kind of going back the day before um you know we had the the 200 im prelims and and that kind of flowed really nicely the 200 im semi was a complete disaster um it was it was not a great swim and um you know lucky enough that this this year it was a little slower and i was still able to get a lane but the, the biggest thing for me you know out in lane seven or if i was in lane three or two or one, whatever lane it's, I, I just have to go in and swim my own race. Um, you kind of have an idea of what people are going to do. You know, Shane's going to be out quick, you know, Carson's yep. going to be fast to the hundred. Um, yep. but in, in reality, it's, if they were there or not, in theory, you'll be able to swim the same speed. So you, you just have to play to your strengths and you just go in. Um, for me, it was, it was make sure, you know, I knew I had some fast, uh, I knew I had a fast fly from the 50, um, so utilize the front end speed and, and not be afraid to kind of attack, you, you know, going into a race, if, if it's going to be a good swim, it's going to hurt. Um, so just accepting the fact that it is going to hurt and, and it's going to be quite painful, but, you know, just going out on the fly, um, utilizing my strengths and back sugar, something I've been working on a lot. Um, you know, so a little bit, <laughs> a lot slower than Carson and Shane, but you know, it, it was the 10th faster than what I've been. So that's, that's progressing in a good way. And, and making sure I'm, I'm transitioning well. Um, you know, I, I was home in 27, seven on the freestyle, but my yeah. breaststroke was a 34, five. Yeah. So if I, if I was a, you know, four tenths faster on the breaststroke, I probably would have been, you know, three, four tenths slower on the freestyle. So um, it, it kind of goes hand to hand, but um, again, you know, I f- being out in lane seven, it was nice to kind of swim my own race, but I'm also a racer. So I like being in a race. Um, but I, I really, I, I saw glimpses throughout the entire race and, uh, you know, at the, at the fly to back turn, kind of see where I was positioned yeah. back to breast turn and then the, the breast of free kind of seeing carcinary push off and shame, but, you know, I just swimming my own race and making sure that I'm, I'm putting in the, the power in the right spots and, and holding my stroke together. And I guess it, it all ended up working. So. Oh, dude, what, what's the most painful turn in a 200 IM? 
So you got to you got to fly it back and you got to hold us on the waters. And then, yeah. but the, the crossover turn, you're exhausted and you still have to streamline and you're looking over. And then the last one, you have nothing and you want, you got to kick. What's the most painful oh, one? And how do you gotta it together? Free. It's got to be no, back to breath. No, I, back I to breath. Argue, it's back to breath stroke. Back to oh. breath stroke is by far because so <laughs> I wear a nose plug. Um, I hate how it looks and I, I hate that, <laughs> but it, it, make, it makes it significantly easier. Um, yeah. You know, in back to breast turn, if you're not wearing a nose plug, you're you're going on your back, you're blowing out air from your nose so it doesn't go up your nose, and then you're doing the flip turn, and now you're you got half a set of lungs, you're pushing off, you have to hold the streamline, you have to wait, you know, a second before you do your kick, and the breast stroke pullout isn't, you can't rush it either, so it's like it, it's a lot of holding breath and just being patient. And that definitely, you know, you can start your, you can start to feel your body convulse a little bit, you know, get the little shakes a little bit, but um, that's definitely the hardest because breaststroke in itself is very hypoxic. Um, yep. You know, you, if you're only doing 18 strokes, you're only getting 18 breaths in that, in that 50. So, um, you know, that, that's by far the hardest when it comes to freestyle. I think you're just, you're already in so much pain and things just kind of flash in and out of, you know, so, um, but yeah, the, the back to breast for me, for sure. See, I think I heard it. It's really breast of free, but you've already blacked ev- or blocked yeah. everything out because you're already in so much pain. It doesn't yeah, even yeah. register anymore. So it's like beyond the threshold. Yeah, that's definitely it. <laughs> so um, you mentioned, you know, knowing the other athletes race strategies, um, Carson and, and Shane at world champs at the Olympics, Leon's going to be there. And I think everyone would agree he, he's the favorite going into it. Um, how do you keep in mind other people's race strategies at the Olympics where obviously the medals are, are the main thing versus trying to stay with your own race plan, not get too caught up in what other athletes are doing around you? Yeah, I think it's a it's a good idea to know kind of what athletes are going to do. Um, I think it's more important for the longer distances to, to have a better idea. Um, in the junior I am, it, it's it's pretty much 450 max that, that that's that's what it is and if, you, if you're spending too much time worrying about oh is is you know Duncan going to be quick on that breaststroke or should I be ahead of Carson going to that for you know it's just like you're, you're thinking too much it's it, the biggest thing is just switching the brain off I know exactly how I'm going to swim it and that's all I can control you can't control what what those guys are doing um you know and going into a race if, if you think uh Shane's going to be quick and then all of a sudden you're at his feet and he's a lot quicker and you're basing your entire race on their game plan. It's going to throw you off. So I think, I think the biggest thing is sticking with your game plan. Um, obviously being aware of what swimmers might be doing, but you shouldn't be basing your entire race off of, of what they're doing. Cause you know, swimming is, swimming is a weird sport. It, you know, come, come the Olympics, the, the junior IM is going to be day, day six or seven. So some swimmers are going to be pretty heavily loaded. Some people are going to be fresh that's going to ultimately impact the way people swim that race. So I, I, I personally believe you can't um, base your your entire race on other people's game plans, but ha- definitely have an idea, know, know kind of where they're at. So when, you know, you come to a turn and you're behind, you're, you're not freaking out or panicking. Uh, it's been 13 years since somebody's hit that world record, um, that 154-0. Uh, mm-hmm. And we, you know, 154 is is something that not many, not many people have done. Four people have done it from from what I'm looking here. What is it going to take to 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 get that massive drop down? Right now, Leon's a 140, mm-hmm. 154 eight. What is it going to take to get under that? Because you just had a massive drop yourself. What does it take to get under that world record? Well, ultimately, it's it's the last three fifties. <laughs> it's it's pretty much the whole race. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's it's. Uh, you know, if you ever watch a tune in IM, majority of the people are going to be under world record pace come the 50. Um, but not a lot of people are going to be under world record pace at the backstroke. Uh, wow. Monty has incredible backstroke. It's it's learning how to have a fast fly, but not, be, if not to tax your, the rest of your race. Um, coming into that backstroke, using the momentum from the backstroke into the breaststroke. Lochte split a crazy breaststroke split, even though his breaststroke was his weakest. And then coming home, I think his his freestyle split is a, a 27.4. So it, it, it's a yeah. very, very impressive swim. And, it, you know, comparing myself to that, it's I got the fly, but I don't have the back. I'm 
you know, second and a bit off that. I'm a second and a bit off the, the breaststroke. And I'm e even with a slow breaststroke and a fast freestyle, I'm still off the, the freestyle. So um, th there's still a lot of work to be done. But, um, you know, it, it, with swimming, I, I feel like it gets that reputation that, um, you know, people are done peaking around 23, 24. But you really see it's yeah. it's the older swimmers are the ones who are getting the, the most experience, like finding their strokes. So it, it, it's a, it's a patient game. And um, totally. for me, you know, it's, it, I, I took off quite a bit of time, but it's just each year going in and, and improving on skills and improving on aspects of the race and, and uh, making sure that even though I did take off a lot of time, I could tell you 10 things as soon as I touched the wall, but I need to improve on, which would help me get faster. So um, just, just being patient with, with, with the way your body's progressing and the way your body is, um, kind of adapting to the training and all that stuff. And, and I, I personally believe the people who are the most patient are the ones that's going to pay off for it. So. All right. Well, it takes a lot of patience to swim at 200 IM, especially. Um, and you have the fly down, like you said, you, you go at 24 point. How do you swim a fast 24 point fly, but it's easy and hasn't taxed too much? What do you do to ensure that you're still there? You, you've nailed it. What, what do you do to ensure it's a fast, but easy? Yeah, I think... Um, Part of it is just certain strokes come naturally to some swimmers. Um, from when I was eight years old, fly was one of those strokes that I was able to pick up pretty quickly. Um, so it, it's just using my strengths there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm able to swim a pretty relaxed 24 point. It doesn't feel like it taxes me that well. But then again, I'm, I'm struggling on the backstroke. Um, you look at Carson, he's got an incredible backstroke. His 28 yeah. split backstroke is probably less taxing than my 29 five backstroke. But, you know, he, growing up, he was a backstroker. So it's just um, part of it is certain strokes come more naturally to other swimmers. And that's that's the beauty of a tuned IM is it, it will go like this the entire race. And you'll see some swimmers who are naturally just have a better feel for a certain stroke and um, others not. But then again, it, it's not something you can't learn. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, when I was... When I was 19, um, or e even when I was 18, before the, like World Juniors, I was going out 26-3 for the fly, and yeah. just with you know trusting myself and being a little bit more aggressive, I'm you know I was going out 25-5 at, at World Juniors, and nothing had changed in my training. Nothing had changed in in the way I was working on certain things. It was just trusting myself and and yeah, yeah. Um, trusting your abilities. So. What's a set that you guys are working on now that maybe helps work in your backstroke? Maybe it's maintaining your tempo, or making sure that your your, hit, your 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 streamline's good, or your catch, you, or you're saving your legs. Is there a set you're doing now just that focuses on that middle hundred of to the IM? To me, the middle hundred is so key. Is there a set you're working on? Yeah, I think you know we're, we're ten weeks out. The, the the first thing is just getting as silly as it sounds, just getting comfortable with the strokes, um, mm. just swimming just swimming backstroke, making sure I'm doing the right technique. I'm getting the shoulders rolling, um, yeah. just getting more comfortable swimming, swimming backstroke. And same thing with breaststroke. Breaststroke's a weird one because, you know, it can feel off for five, six, seven weeks. And then a week before your main competition is on and all of a sudden you're dropping crazy time and, and vice versa. So um, it, it's try not to overanalyze how things are feeling, but um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the biggest thing that everyone would, would do in, in a situation like myself is, um, you know, you, you got to work on transitions from having that fly, feeling the fly fatigue into having a fast backstroke with, with holding consistent tempo. I, I know my tempo drops quite a bit from the start to the finish. I feel like that's probably why I'm a little bit more successful uh, at short horse meters because you get that turn in there and it breaks it up. But it's just holding, being able to hold that tempo. Um, and then from a kind of hard backstroke, being able to, to hold the water and breaststroke. So just working on transitions and, and, and holding tempo and, you know, the, the basics of, I guess, swimming and like back end speed and stuff. Hey, one thing, the, the, the 100 IM for me, I love the 100 IM because I fight, by the time I got tired in, in the fly, I could I rest. And by the time I got tired in back, it was a different muscles and it was a mindset, different, it just felt different. Is, where do you rank 200 IM pain among all the 200s that we have? It, it's 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 hard to rank it because with the 200 IM, obviously it's four strokes, so you're hitting 
all muscle groups, all different strokes, your, your whole body's going to be hurting. But then again, I don't get this. If I were to do a tuner back short course, my legs are going to be burning way more in, in that than a tuner I am. If I were to do a tuner breaststroke short course, my, you know, my biceps, and my forms are going to be burning way, way more than in a tuner I am. So it, I feel like every stroke has got their own little unique things that make it deem the hardest. Um, so I, I, I personally could, I would say tuner nine isn't the hardest because, you know, I feel like it's a little, a little ironic sure. being like, you know, you're the best, you know, like tuner nine is my best yeah. event and being like, oh yeah, well, tuner nine is obviously the hardest. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I would say the hardest event for a tuner is, would be a tuner back short course. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's okay. super taxing on the legs. You're keeping a, a high tempo. It's it's something that would be very very. It, it is very very difficult, and I respect those two new back strokes a lot. Yeah. All right. Well, as swimmers, we all have preferences and training, so we're going to have a, a short little fun segment called "This or That." To learn yeah. about your training segments that you like or mm -hmm. different things. So, do you prefer morning or afternoon practice? Oh, afternoon. Do you prefer indoor or outdoor pool? Outdoor. Because you can get a little bit of tan, but indoor for backstroke. Yeah. Prefer short course or long course? I would say long course now as I've gotten older. Mm -hmm. Would you rather do a thousand IM or 500 fly? Thousand IM. You prefer warm up or warm down? Warm down. Do you prefer to lift before or after swimming? Uh, after swimming, yeah. What do you like better, squats or deadlifts? Neither. <laughs> Bench. You get a practice, one thing um, at the end of a practice. Would you rather do starts or turns? Starts. And do you like kick sets or pull sets? <laughs> uh, pull sets. All right. Well, uh, Finley, you, <laughs> you you stumped us. We're like, okay. What university did he go to? What? Finley Knox? Nope, 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 nope. Talk to me about the decision that uh, of, of what you did. You, you, you turned pro, basically, right away. You talk about your career, your history, your path, you took training centers, and was, it, was the fact that you, know, you wanted to go to McGill, but you just said, nah, I'm gonna train for the Olympics instead. Is that what happened? Talk to me. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the school's tricky because Obviously, being Canadian, there's you go to a Canadian university and, and kind of swim with with youth sports or do you go down to the NC2A route? Um, being up in Canada, obviously, it's a little harder to understand how the NCAA, NC2A works. And mm -hmm. um, especially being in a small town, there's not a lot of information about it. And um, and then on top of that, it, it's, it's all based on performances and how fast you actually are. Um, for me, I wouldn't say I got necessarily fast or kind of on, on the radar till worlds, uh, world juniors in, in 2019. And at that point I'd already graduated high school and I'd already made my decision, you know, the year before I was going 202s for junior I am. And, you know, you got Carson who's, who's already ripping 159, 158. So it's like, if, if you compare me to him, I'm not at his level. I'm, I'm not going to be able to get a, yeah. a good, um, I guess ride to a to a high level school, and unless you're performing well, so um, I was kind of in a pickle where I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, my coach actually reached out to Ben Titley uh, at the High Performance Center. It, it was one of those years where I graduated in 2019. The Olympics were in 2020. If there was ever a year to do a gap year, it was, was going to be that year. And um, my coach knew that the the program that he has and um, the, the athletes he was surrounded by wasn't going to be the best fit for me. Um, so he, he wanted to make sure he was putting me in a spot that would give me the best opportunity to make the Olympics. Um, okay. so he reached out to Ben and we talked, this was about, uh, December of, of 2018. Um, so about six months before my graduation. And at that point I, I had enjoyed what I had seen and, and knew that that was probably going to be the best fit for me. Um, and I had committed to going to HBC Ontario with Ben um, for that Olympic year. So at that point, I'd already kind of put off school. Um, and then Ben being 
like knowing everyone and ISL coming up, it gave me an opportunity to to do ISL. And, you know, if, if I wasn't part of the center and if I didn't know Ben, and uh, I absolutely would not have been on an ISL team. I, I hadn't performed mm -hmm. well enough to, to even be considered. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was super, super lucky and super grateful to, to kind of have that position. And once I had decided, you know, once I got the, the offer to be on, on London Roar and have the opportunity to swim pro, it kind of, you know, made the decision for me. It, it's either I go to ISL and whatever I make with ISL, that's what I'll put towards school. And, um, mm -hmm. or I decide to go to school in the States and, and get hopefully everything covered. So, um, I kind of looked at what would be best for, for my experience in, and as an athlete, the, the first thing that was the, the best option was, was ISL. So, um, once I decided to do ISL, I knew NC2As was kind of out the option. And mm -hmm. then g moving forward, it was training for the Olympic year. It was going to be one gap year. COVID happened. It got postponed. So then it ended up being two. Um, you know, uh, I've talked about this a, a few times, but before the Olympics, I broke my hand. Um, mm -hmm. I needed surgery post-Olympics. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go and start something new while having – uh, doing all my rehab and all that stuff. So going in and taking another gap year and then um, World Cups became kind of a, a point for me to make money. I was starting to get fast enough where I, I was able to perform quite well at those. So taking that opportunity and it's kind of ended up being this, I'll take one gap year and opportunities came up. And um, yep. my biggest thing is when I retire from swimming, I, I don't want to look back at my career and be and kind of be upset that I made certain decisions um, you know, to go to school or do this and miss out on the opportunities to kind of travel the world and, and kind of live the life of, of a pro athlete. So um, that, that's kind of the route it, it went. And, um, you know, if I were to look back, you know, I could have made some different decisions. And uh, what if I went to NCAA, what I did this, but, um, you know, I, as a still swimming right now, I got to be content with what I've, what decisions I made and, and know that it was the best, right. Uh, the, the best decision for me. Uh, it sounds well thought out, almost well planned and executed and it's, and it's paying dividends. So, so, so well done there. Um, yeah, but I do want to ask a question about U Sports. So today's March 2nd and U Sports start in a few days time. I'm going to be lucky enough heading up to go watch it. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons that people say that the American uh, swimmers are so powerful is because of the NCAA system, right? Of what they have it, and, and what they're fostering in the competition. Um, Canada arguably has the second best university um, sw swimming system in the world. Frankly, because I don't know of another one <laughs> to be that that's so strong, but Canada's right there. But Canada is not arguably the second best swimming nation. Um, you know, and, and the, the great Canadian swimmers, not many have competed in the U sports of Canada. You know, some did, uh, Curtis Maiden did, Brent Hayden did, uh, you know, we, uh, Marion Limpert did, uh, Christian Ot these, these people. Do you think that the U sports needs to be improved to, to, to continue Canada's rise in swimming? Or do you think it's, it's a mixture of what Australia is doing in Canada with the national training centers? NCAA is, is a mix. What's your opinion on the value of, of, of a good homegrown collegiate racing system? Well, so I guess the first thing is just, you just kind of have to look at population. Um, yeah. The U.S. has, they're, they're a lot, they have more depth in swimming simply because of their, their numbers. Um, you know, I, I'm, I think I've heard something where there's, there's more swimmers in California than there are in, in Canada. There are more competitive swimmers in California than Canada. So it's, yeah. If, you, if you just look at it like that, obviously we're already on the back foot. Um, and then the other thing you got us, which is yards, they got their SATs and ACTs and yeah. it, it's all kind of integrated. And a lot of times it's, if you're a fast, you know, high schooler, you, you get the opportunity to swim with um, universities and it, that's the whole process. Whereas in Canada, it's more, you know, you're at club you know, or a lot of people in uh, the U.S. they train for their high schools. Whereas in in Canada, I think there's only one or two provinces that do like good high school swimming, and, and all of it's club swimming. So um, we're always in a position where it's, um, you know, obviously you're attracted to what's the best, and mm -hmm. if you're able to perform at the best, you you want to go there. Hence why you know Josh went to the NCAA's, Maggie's down there. Um, yep. You got a lot of well-known swimmers in Canada who did compete for NC2As. And, um, 
but you know, it's, 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 I think it all boils down to, to numbers. It's, yeah. um, you know, if you look at even our trials, we got, you know, top three are, are, are usually maybe for girls, it's, it's a little bit more deep for guys. It's usually one to three swimmers are quite fast in, in an event. Okay. And then it opens up, you look at the U S you know, the time that would have came second at, at Canadian trials wouldn't have made uh, the U S final. And, and that, again, that, that just kind of comes down to numbers, but um, yeah, I think it, Canada's doing the best they can uh, with the, the collegiate system. And um, I think if, if, the, if it wants to improve, it, it's trying to keep the good Canadian swimmers to stay in Canada, which it, it's going to be a tough, tough sell. But um, totally. again, it's just being patient with that and, and trying to work out different ways. Now, if the U.S. did short course meters instead of yards and they're able to kind of integrate the both, I think that would have, that would be, um, you know, if they were to able to open up NC2As into Canada, um, and it was all even across the board. I feel like that would be beneficial for both sides, but you know, you can't make the rules and, um, this is just the situation we're in right now. Yeah. I mean, dude, you, you can set world records at Canadian university. I'm going to plug Canada swimming for a little bit. Okay. You can set world records there because short course meters, the, the, the facilities are great. There is some money you can get. The coaching is good. You have to deal with the weather, but you could go to Vancouver. <laughs> so it's okay. yeah, you're still dealing with the rain. You get, you get five years of eligibility, so which is yeah. also a nice thing as well. Um, but yeah, I get it, and um, and I'm 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 pushing new sports, um, trying to get it up there out of other circuits. But I understand being in America for 15 years, the draw to the NCAA system, and I must say I do wish I had a, a opportunity to race there more. You know, and the most you get to Finley, you race Americans at the Pro Series, you go down to the Pro Series, maybe you and then you go to World Cups, but that's that's your local racing. Where do you race? Like, um, where do you get your racing in? I would say, besides the big yeah, international so, meets. Yeah, so it, obviously it's split into to kind of three different categories. There's, you know, racing internationally for Canada, whether that's a Worlds or a Marin Ostrom Tour. Um, and then there's the, you know, dipping down into the U.S. where you're doing your Pro Series meets. Um, and then the, the local meets where it's, it's not, I guess – going to a certain swim meet to, to get that swim meet experience. It's to go mm -hmm. there, kind of swim in a, a pretty difficult situation. You know, there's no one in the stands. It's yeah. you're racing, you know, people who are quite a bit slower than you, but you just have to learn to kind of dig down, yeah. uh, dig deep and, and be tough in those situations. So um, the, the, the quick ones are, are the ones where it's, you know, it's a time final session at the UBC pool, um, you know, Canada hosts a, a few high-level competitions with the the Melzay Jack. Usually, a, yep. a few Florida swimmers come up there. Uh, this year, we have the Toronto Open. That's a new um, new meet we're doing this year, so that'll be pretty fast. Um, but yeah, so staying in Canada, you, you kind of just stick with the, the local meets, and then um, you know, you obviously want to get some some fast racing in. So that's when you go down to the Pro Series meets. You know, it gives you an opportunity to make a little bit of cash of the. Uh, if you perform yeah. well, and then, um, and then the international meets, that's usually the the world championships or you know Commonwealth Games, uh, those sort of things. So you, you got to kind of have your your fair share of all of them. Um, got to get the the local meets in to kind of see where you're at. The pro series meets yeah. to kind of have that pressure and that competition, and then the, the big meets are are where it really matters. As an American, it's, it's great to hear your journey and story just because, like you said, it, it's a little bit different, especially from what most Americans would think, where you just go to college and you just keep going up from mm -hmm. ISL all the way to um, the World Cups. And now even going into creating your own brand and your own logo with, with the Finn logo and everything, I guess, what was the um, inspiration and an idea behind starting that brand and, and what you hope to achieve with it? Yeah, so... Um, I guess bringing it back to 2022 trials, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sponsored by anyone, um, uh, with, uh, with, with the high performance centers, we, we don't have like a huge, huge budget, so we don't get uh, race caps or anything like that. And I found myself like going through these, these pictures from the meet and I'm wearing a blank cap. I'm, I'm wearing some random jacket that I, you know, just a blank Lulu jacket that I have. And. Um, you know, I kind of looked at that and I was like, man, like I, I really have an opportunity to, to kind of branch out and do something. Um, I'm pretty big into F1. And if you look at any of those drivers, they got their own logos. They, they're, they got their own kind of, um, brand and, 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 uh, personal marketing stuff. So, um, 
I remember having a call with my dad and my mom and being like, you know, I kind of want to do something cool. I, I've, I've always, you know, I'm, I'm not the most outgoing person, but um, I definitely like to, to kind of do stuff that sets me apart from other people. If people are paying attention, you know, with, with my suit, this, you know, if I'm wearing a Speedo suit or, um, you know, I'll, I'll Sharpie it a different color or um, mm -hmm. certain things I'll do with my caps and goggles. So I know that, you know, someone doesn't have that, you know, changing up the, the colors of the straps and that so that um, nice. it's a little bit different. And um, I really wanted to jump on this, like, you know, you, you see, obviously when Michael Phelps came out with his his mm -hmm. company and his logo and Adam Petey kind of did something. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you're looking at like Max Verstappen or Alex Albon, you know, those those F1 drivers, they have their own logo. It's mm -hmm. it's always on part of their kid and part of their team. And with with being in a, in a high performance center where they're pretty lax on on what you wear at swim meets, I was you know, I wanted to take the opportunity to kind of do something different. You know, no one in Canada had had come out with a logo or anything like that. And um, I sat down with my dad and um, started brainstorming a few things. He came up with a sketch and um, kind of took it from there. So it, it's, it's, it's kind of my way of, of expressing myself and just kind of set, setting myself apart from everyone. Um, you know, I, obviously um, performances are a huge thing, but I, I want to be able to end my swimming career and not everyone look back and just be like, oh, Finley was – like I know Finley because he was a good swimmer. I, I want people to look back and be like, you know, Finley, he had this going and this going. So it's 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 kind of just taking the the opportunity. You know, I'm not in school, so having the the time to just do something something fun and and kind of start something new that isn't really popular in in Canadian swimming at least. And dude, taking control, man, taking control. It's it's you. It's your career. It's your life. And it seems like you have really good support and partners. Even Speedo Canada. And Speedo Canada has always been a great. When I was swimming, they were great. It's great that they've partnered with you to create their own brand and stuff. That's rare. I mean, Adidas does that with some big athletes. Talk about that relationship with um, you know, that furthering that brand and developing that brand. And is the idea maybe one day to create products of your own, or are you just gonna be branding for now? Yeah. So, um. I guess that was kind of a two-part question. The first one, yeah, um, right. <laughs> uh, Speedo, where, you know, we, we have a, a partnership deal with Speedo, uh, with Swimming Canada, and uh, Speedo's been fantastic. Um, you know, I, I had this idea, and I reached out to a few companies, and and Speedo was really the the one to to latch on and be like, look, we we want to support you, and and uh, we're more than happy to to help out. So, you know, they're the ones who, to, you know, provide me with the clothes and, and make the caps that I have, and and stuff like that so that they they did a fantastic job and i'm super grateful for that um in terms of what i want to do with it um i'm kind of going through the the phase of trying to get it trademarked uh you know so it gives me the option to to kind of uh you know put it into clothing or d do something with that obviously focusing on swimming right now it's there's a lot of ideas going on, um, but I think right now it's it's getting it trademarked. I'm gonna the logo is actually gonna be changing, um, it just slightly, just uh, uh, with with the trademarking. That there's certain conflicts and 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 doing that. But once once it's trademarked, then you know my my biggest goal is to be able to put out you know maybe a shirt or something like that and go to a trials and see a kid up in the stands wearing my shirt. If if you you know I, I grew up watching hockey. Everyone would go to the Flames games. They, they got their jerseys. They've got their favorite players on the back. And you go to a Canadian trials and it's like, you know, what do you wear? You, you just wear your regular clothes. You know, no yeah. one has stuff where it's like you can really um, support your favorite swimmer. And and I guess I'm starting to, to try to dive into being able to produce something where uh, fans who, who want to come watch can support their favorite swimmer and, and uh, do stuff like that. So obviously, it, it's still in the very yeah. early stages, and and yeah. things might change. But you know, my, my biggest goal is to to go to a trials, finish a race, look up in the stands, and regardless of how it went, you know, there's, there's a kid in the stands with with a shirt on with my logo, and um, is just there because they're stoked to see their favorite swimmer. So you just want your fans all showing up with your logo on a bunch of speedos in the stands cheering for you, all ages, everyone just <laughs> rocking it. Yeah, I think I think it would be awesome. You know, it's like um, again being an F one fan, you, you you see all the the pre race stuff, and they're walking down. Everyone's wearing their favorite um, teams uh, kit and all that stuff. And I would love to be able to, 
you know, obviously it's never going to be that big. And rather than having a couple hundred fans wanting your signature, you know, it'll be maybe one or two. Um, but it'll be awesome to be able to um, provide something for those 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 fans that that want to support their favorite athlete. And um, you know, it, it, the the marketing and the the platform of swimming is still very very small. And um, I want to be able to provide a a platform for my fans to support myself. You know, and in a selfish way, it might sound a little selfish, but you know, it's when I. When I was going to hockey, you know, I had a Jerome McGinley jersey and, I, you know, I couldn't wait to see him play. And, um, yeah. you know, thinking about when I went to uh, I was I was part of a camp that went and watched Olympic trials in 2016. And, you know, I had a few swimmers that I was like pretty excited to go watch, you know, Ryan Cochran. And stuff, but like you, you just show up with like a swim Alberta shirt and you're like, uh, you know, I want to I want to be able to go out there and like see my favorite swimmer and show that he's got so you know, I'm supporting them. So. It's kind of the goal, um, but we'll see kind of where it goes. Well, we're, we're fully behind you. And for those who are listening, this show tends to be a lot of show and tell. So it's better to watch it sometimes because I had the honor of being spending last week in London at, in walking at the McLaren Test um, Center. So I worked for McLaren all week and it was sick. So one of the things they, they gave oh, me nice. is like, you know, it's all the hats and the branding, right? So this is McLaren branding. And I worked with the McLaren team and I love that you're taking cues from a, some special like Formula One. Because Formula One, mm -hmm. my hair's awesome. Formula One has um, the best way of, of growing their sport. They, mm -hmm. they, they focus on their brand. They maintain their brand. So yes, you have cars with sponsorship all over them. Some have a lot more. Some have a lot less than sponsorship. But they're very a stickler about their brand. For instance, McLaren says this is papaya. It has to be. And no longer blue on the back, all orange, because their brand is what their value is, is what the, their name is, and that's what drives them. And I am proud to wear this, because I know Lando Norris is going is, is wearing this, and I'm, I'm a fan, I, I, I like how Lando drives. Um, so, and another thing that Formula One did is that they had the Netflix um, behind the scenes of Netflix, and they didn't choose the Verstappens and the Hamiltons, they went for the Alberts, for the midline athletes, um, they had and follow them and got to know them and built their fan base. Dude, we're in an age of, of swimming where we can do that now. We have Brett and Sonny and Kyle doing great work out there promoting our athletes behind the stories. Um, who, who, who are you a fan of? Who do you follow? Who, is, who are you a fan of? Maybe is a, is a current rival or a past um, swimmer that you like? I just liked him for who that person was, not necessarily for how fast they went. Yeah, I think... Um... You know, I think Mike Landry does a fantastic job. He he's really the one who's yeah. who's putting himself out there and being yeah. vulnerable and and um, you know it, it is difficult. I'm trying to be a little bit more open on my Instagram and and kind of nice. explore the you know behind the scenes stuff. Obviously, it is difficult because people are gonna have you know your, your buddies are gonna tease you and stuff. But <laughs> um, one of my like my favorite things as as an athlete is is seeing the behind the scenes stuff of, of other athletes growing up. Yeah. I skateboarded a lot. And, you know, my mm -hmm. favorite thing was to see like, Oh, what was Ryan Sheckler's setup or what's Nigel Houston? Like what trucks is he's using? And, and like seeing all the, the kind of uh, yeah. nerdy stuff of, of that. So um, I'm definitely trying to be a little bit more open. So people have a, a better idea of who I am and, and, and all that. But um, yeah, in terms of Kyle, he's uh, doing a great job of promoting yeah. swimming a lot more and, um, you know, you, you see all of his clips on Instagram and, and I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, Michael Andrew, obviously he's, he's been there from, from pretty much day one. Um, yeah. and I, I, I personally love seeing the behind the scenes stuff. And, um, as someone who likes what, like seeing it, I'm trying to do a little bit more myself. Um, right. so kind of, I guess, pushing the Instagram a little bit more, but it, it's ultimately putting out stuff that I wish I could see from my favorite athletes. Um, and, you know, it is difficult because, you know, some so you're going to get teased and stuff. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, I, I was just watching a video the other day of uh, Lewis talking about his steering wheel and all yeah. the different things. And, you know, for me, I love that. I love that that information and all the the nerdy stuff. So um, yeah. hopefully trying to be a little bit more like that in the future. And as I develop myself as an athlete and as a person as well. Yeah, as a side note, all the drivers have their own personal steering wheels. I didn't know that. And it was like yeah. really like like um like particular to them. It's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Right. John, go ahead. All right, we're gonna wrap up here with some rapid fire questions. Okay. You mentioned 200 back short course earlier, but what is the hardest race in swimming? 
Well, I, I guess like the, the the short answer would obviously be like 4 a.m. to fly 1500 long course, those like grueling races. But I feel like if, if a race were to be swum very correctly, it, it would be a hard toss up, toss up between a two in your backstroke short course, just with all those underwaters or, or obviously a four and I am you're hitting every every stroke, every muscle, your body's fatigued. And yeah. Olympic gold or world record? Uh, Olympic gold. Do you pee in the pool? Of course. What's the most annoying thing a teammate or training partner can do? <laughs> Probably pee next to you. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most unbeatable world record on the books? Uh, probably, you know, I'll say like women's two fly, but you know, summer she's, uh, she's, she's kind of got that under wraps. I feel like in the next few years. So, but yeah, right now the women's two fly, it's, it's un- unbelievable. What swimmer are you most excited to watch at the Olympics? Uh, you know, probably probably Josh uh, mm-hmm. Summer, and you know, obviously the Canadians. But you know, Leon's been been fantastic. I I, I think he's going to be swimming amazing, especially in the, his home crowd. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm I'm a huge fan of swimming, so so many athletes I'm looking forward to to watching race, and obviously myself. <laughs> <laughs> Who would you say is the greatest Canadian swimmer of all time? Oh, that's difficult. I would say you, you would have to probably say summer right now. She's, she's the one who's achieved the most at the youngest age. And, but like, there's so many, you got, you got like Brent, who's, who's obviously world champ and Olympic medalist. You got Ryan Cochran, who's, who's been a staple of distance swimming, Kylie Moss, Maggie, you know, there's so many big names. Um, but currently it's for sure summer. Mm-hmm. How many gold medals will Canada win in swimming at the Paris Olympics? I guess you'll have to find out. <laughs> find out. Have you ever cried during practice? Oh, probably. Yeah, probably when I was younger. Um, definitely. Uh, there's definitely been frustrating practices where it definitely gets the better of you. I don't think recently. Um, I've been pretty happy during practice, but I, I, of course, I think every swimmer has. All right. And last one. How often do you do social kick? I did a lot more when I was in, uh, in Ontario. Um, right now it's, it's more of a, a social walk to the car sort of thing. <laughs> all right, Finley, that's all, all we have here. So thanks again for joining us today. We wish you the best of luck. Hope to see a bunch of fans with the Finn logo at Canadian trials at the Olympics supporting you on here. Sure, you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's a, it's an amazing platform you guys have and, I'm uh, lucky to be on it. Thank no, you. I appreciate it. All right, everyone. Well, that's another episode of Social Kick. Once again, you can follow us at Social Kick Swim online, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Yeah. All right. See you guys. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it, and be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick, and you can find all of our content on our website at thesocialkick.com.